All right, uh, so welcome back, everybody. Um, our next speaker is Elodie Gadin. She's professor at uh, the NYU Center for Genomics and Systems Biology. Um, she's the recipient of many awards, uh, including a MacArthur Award. Um, she has focused on influenza evolution and also the interplay of pathogens with the microbiome. And she, her talk is entitled Frenemies. Microbial Interactions and Respiratory Diseases. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you, want, do you want to adjust the sound a little bit? I think I'm echoing. Well, Julie, thank you very much because you really brought up the biome, so I don't have to, right? So this is perfect. Now you've all heard of the microbiome, and um, as Julie mentioned, humans or any mammal, we're basically a biome with a human around it, right? So there are microbiome projects for any body part. Any body part. Right? There really is. And most of what we hear about the microbiome in the literature and in the news is often about the gut microbiome. And we've heard a little bit in what Julie discussed with uh, some antibiotic resistance in the, in the gut and how we do uh, stool transplants to overcome some of the antibiotic resistance. What we don't know a lot about is actually the respiratory microbiome. And so the, um, we often say that the skin is probably the largest surface area that the body is exposed to the outside or to the outside environment, when in fact, it's the lungs. And if you take the surface area of the lungs, you could cover a football field for sure. And what happens is that you're basically inhaling bacteria, you're inhaling fungus, uh, viruses all the time, and that will do something to the lungs. And for the lung longest time, um, we thought, I don't know why, that the lungs were a sterile environment. And when you think about it, it doesn't really make sense. But the lung microbiome is an interesting environment, but the whole respiratory tract is interesting. Now, what's very different about looking at the respiratory tract compared to the gut, for example, is that the gut is a very rich environment for bacteria or any other microbes. So we consider it nutrient rich. And this is a bit of a, uh, just a, a rough representation of what it looks like in the, in the lungs, actually. So here, if we look at healthy individuals, it's considered more of a nutrient poor environment. So what you have is basically um, very few bacteria um, and then you have this tight junction between the cells, the epithelial cells, and you don't have all that material that you have, for example, in the guts. It's only when the epithelial cells are destroyed that then you'll have some proteins, all kinds of molecules that are released and that can come and feed the bacteria. So that's why we say the respiratory tract is, in fact, more of a nutrient-poor environment. So it's actually quite hard to study, especially the lower lungs. It's very hard to study compared to studying the gut, where you would collect just a stool and then analyze the bacteria or whatever else in that environment. So let me tell you about influenza and what role does the the respiratory microbiome play in influenza infections. So I'll tell you a couple of stories about infections, viral infections, and how that can disrupt the environment. And conversely, how you can be somewhat protected by your microbiome in certain circumstances. And so we know that when we get the flu, we have uh, the possibility of developing pneumonia, and it's due often to secondary bacterial infections. Now, we often treat these bacteria that we have in our respiratory tract as pathogens, but in fact, they're present all the time. If I sampled anybody in this room, I would probably find a lot of staph, a lot of strep. I don't know exactly which species. I don't know if they're drug resistant. Many are probably antibiotic resistant. But what happens is that when an acute virus like influenza disrupts the epithelium, you then have 
the perfect environment, the inflammation where bacteria will develop. But they may not develop the same way for any type of infection. So what we did is that we actually are doing the oropharynx microbiome, and we're doing the lung, the lower lung microbiome. And I'll, I'll show you different examples of what we do. But just a technical uh, overview of how we do the sampling and how we do the analyses. So you can do different types of analyses when you do the microbiome. You can do the simplest one, which we call target gene sequencing. So you basically collect everything, you extract the DNA, and then you focus only on one gene that is known to be really well conserved across all bacteria. And you just decode, you just sequence that particular gene. And any mutations in that gene are representative of different species of bacteria. So we search them, again, databases. But as we heard this morning, there are a lot of bacteria that haven't been cultured, and that means a lot of bacteria that haven't been decoded. So our reference databases are still relatively poor. But we still assign information to that piece of DNA, and we cluster them together. We look at how they match to each other, and we call those operational taxonomic units, or OTUs. So most of what I'll discuss today is at the OTU level. But another type of analysis is to look at what is actually functional. So the DNA you collect from the bacteria, most of them may be dead. The bacteria may be dead. The DNA is still there. So what you're really reporting is what was once there may not be there at that static time that you collected the sample. And so looking at what is actually expressed, be it at the RNA level, which is what we call the metatranscriptome, or at the metabolite or protein level, as we've heard um, Julie mention earlier. And so we can do the metabolome or the proteome. And I'll touch a little bit about on the metabolome. So first, let's go to influenza. And I'll tell you about two types of studies we're doing. Ideally, we want to sample humans. That's what we're interested in, influenza in humans, knowing what is going on with your microbiome when you have an influenza infection. But there are some experiments you can't do in humans. And so we use the ferret. And ferrets are ideal for uh, influenza research. They sneeze the same way we do. They spit on each other. Uh, they transmit. They get the flu very much the same way we do. After seven days, 10 days, they get better. And so the ferret is great for that. So I'll talk about some time course experiments we did. So if I take samples from your oropharynx and you've had I'm taking it while you have flu A. So flu A is a type of flu when you hear about H1N1 or H5N1 or H3N1, uh, that H3N2, sorry, that's influenza A. And that's why we change the vaccine every year or every other year is because flu A evolves quite quickly. Now, flu B doesn't evolve the same way, but you still get sick. You still get the flu. There are no subtypes for influenza B. So we had a population of about 130 patients, a mix of flu A and flu B, and we looked at their microbiome. Now, it's a static time while they're sick, about two days while they're, they have the flu. So it's acute infection of flu. And here I'm showing you these box plots. Every dot you see represent an individual sample. And what I'm showing are just the relative abundance in a sample of the proportion of that bacteria I'm looking at. And I'm showing these three types of bacteria, or these three genera of bacteria, because they're the ones where we see a large difference whether you were infected with flu A or with flu B. And this indicates that it's not just the fact that you're infected with a virus, it's really what virus you're infected with that will determine what happens with your microbiome, how it's disrupted. And here we color-coded our dots based on age. So what we call young, it's under 18. So at 30, you're not young anymore. And adult is between 18 and 65, and senior is over 65. So here we were interested to see 
does your microbiome change differently when you're infected and according to your age? And so here we're comparing adult and young, and we saw that in the young, there is one type of bacteria that comes up a lot, and that's the Moraxella that we see right here. While in the adult population, we have a mix of different bacteria that seem to take over. So there is a difference in bacteria prevalence and disruption of your microbiome based on age. So let's look more at this, this age category. But now, let's look at vaccination. So these are people, we have a group of 130, like I said, a large proportion of them had gotten the flu vaccine that season, but still got the flu. If I compare the diversity of their microbiota, so basically I'm just looking at all these OTUs, or operational taxonomic units, and I'm just determining how different they are in each individual. So I'm looking at this alpha diversity. And I compare in the young population whether you were vaccinated or not, Diversity is relatively low and quite similar. And I look at the senior group, and we start seeing a trend that the senior population, if they're vaccinated against the flu, even if they get the flu, they have a different representation of the bacteria. So if we focus on these bacteria specifically, and we look at what determines this difference in diversity, we start pulling out certain bacteria that are enriched in people that are not vaccinated versus the ones who are. And you get things like Shigella, you get things like Pastorella, which are considered in the pathogen category, but they're present probably all the time in your microbiome. But we can see here that vaccination does have an effect even though it does not protect you against the actual flu infection. So it has, in the senior group, a positive effect. Okay, so now let's look at what is happening at the interaction level. So we've heard about spewing out this warfare between bacteria. And so what happens is that these bacteria interact all the time. So I'll walk you through these graphs because you'll see quite a few of these. These are my interaction networks. And so what I'm showing is in the unvaccinated group versus the vaccinated group, all the bacteria that are actually co-occurring in different individuals. And so here I have in green these edges or these connections between bacteria that represent positive interactions. And when I mean positive interactions, they're not necessarily physical interactions. In many cases, they're not physical at all. They're mostly chemical interactions. So bacteria are constantly spewing things into their environment and controlling their neighbors. And what we see in the vaccination group, although they may look exactly the same to you in these graphs, you actually see a different number of edges that connect each of these nodes. And so I see, for example, that my little Burkholderia is connected differently with vaccination. It has more connections than without vaccination. Now, these types of graphs that I'm showing are actually using a tool that was developed by a colleague of mine, uh, Rich Bono at NYU, and he calls it speakeasy. A speakeasy as in speakeasy. It's like, you know, in a bar, you're having drinks, you all, you all get along together, and then a bar fight breaks out, and it's the same thing with the bacteria. <laughs> so here we're looking at the ecological association and why this tool is so great, or this statistical analysis is great, is that it actually can analyze sparse data. And looking at bacteria, it is sparse data in the sense that not everybody has the same representation of bacteria in their microbiome. So comparing them and looking at how they co-occur can be a little difficult. All right. So these are my humans with flu. Now let's move to my pissed off ferrets right here. It's not smiling, it's just getting a lot of nasal washes. And here, what we do is that we actually collect, here I say N of 24, we actually have 
a larger number where we sacrifice ferrets at each time point. But here I just wanted to show you when you sample the same individual ferrets over time and what happens in basically real time during a flu infection. So you, can't, you can do this with humans, but they usually don't like getting a long Q-tip Q -tip down their throat. Who would, right? So what happens if I compare my, uh, my ferrets and I look at their core microbiome, I see just by this heat map, you see that the colors change. So the, at day minus two, that's pre-infection, and at day eight, post-infection. And we see some bacteria that start being hot. In the sense here, the red represents prevalence. So I get more of my ferrets that are seeing a higher abundance of some of these bacteria. So if I pull some of these genera or some of these bacteria, I've highlighted here the one called Fusobacterium. So Fusobacterium for a long time was considered just a commensal of the um, respiratory microbiome. And then people start saying, oh, no, no, it's associated with disease, so it's actually a pathogen. And what we see is that it is... It has a role as a pathogen, but it may have another role. Because when we look at interactions, and we look here at a few of these species that have the highest number of changes in the edges. So my edges, if you remember, are these interactions between the nodes. And here I represent when they have just a few edges, and post-infection, they get most edges. So my strep, for example, seems to become a more important key player, and it's starting to interact with more of the other bacteria than it did pre-infection. And so Physobacterium here is actually the bacterium, or group of bacteria, that were the most connected. And so if I look here at pre-infection, super connected, lots of network, the Larry Gold of bacteria, and then post-infection, you're losing your interactions. And so we think that actually Fusobacterium is one of these key nodes or key bacteria that may be controlling a lot of its other neighbors. And it's thought to be associated also with biofilm formation. So there's something going on here looking at our interactions. Okay, so that was flu. That's what we're seeing in flu. Now let's move to something like HIV. So while flu will disrupt physically your epithelium and the bacteria will replicate in situ where the infection has occurred, with HIV, it's slightly different, right? As you know, it will, um, it will disrupt your immune system, and so there are uh, all kinds of consequences to that. Well, it turns out that the HIV population has one of the highest prevalence of COPD, and it's not clear exactly why. So there are some ideas that because of the impaired host defense, here, this is uh, HIV. You have more microbial colonization, which will lead to inflammatory response, as we saw in our upper respiratory tract for flu. And then it'll have an effect on the lung, lung tissue, and uh, lung function. And so you see progression of COPD. Now, this highest, higher prevalence of COPD in the HIV population is independent of smoking. So it's been controlled for that. So there's possibly something going on. And so the NIH had funded a program called the Lung HIV Microbiome Project, which is now done. But there was a lot of work done under that program. And this was what was really difficult. This is a bronchoalveolar lavage, okay? So no fun at all. And one of the biggest problems is that you go through the mouth, and the mouth is a very rich microbial environment, far more than the lower lungs. So we had to do all kinds of things to make sure we weren't contaminating our samples as we went further down in the lungs. And so there are ways of analyzing the data so you can get rid of the, what would be a contaminant. The other problem is that not everything is a contaminant because most of the microbes that do end up down in the lungs are from the mouth. 
And so when you have health issues, when you have a disrupted respiratory tract or the ep epithelium is dis disrupted, you get microaspirations. And so you don't get movement out or the mucus is not doing its job and pulling the bacteria or anything else out. Then you could have oral residents that are replicating in your lower lungs. So here's what we did. We took the DNA that we extracted from the BAL, so from the bronchoalveolar lavage, and then we looked here. Each dot represents a different individual. And we had a group that had HIV, a group that did not have HIV, so our healthy controls. And we looked at how the samples would cluster together based on the representation of their microbiota. So what we should be seeing, if when you have HIV, your lung microbiome is different, you should see a nice clustering of the groups separately. But we see them completely mixed. However, when we look at the function, so remember my 60s is only at the DNA, so there's no function, it's presence, absence. When you look at the function, so at the metabolome, we see a complete clustering of the HIV group. So there is something going on here at the functional level when you have HIV. And by the way, these are uh, very healthy HIV-positive patients. It's well-controlled HIV, but they can develop COPD. So here I have a mix of people with COPD or no COPD, and I'm not showing how they separate out in this case. So what we saw when you look at the metabolites we saw that there were some metabolites that were overrepresented in the HIV group. Now, these metabolites can be bacterial, fungal, human. We don't know where they come from because you can't really tag them at whether they're bacterial or from the host. But we saw one that was really interesting was cysteine. And so cysteine is basically two cysteines together and cysteine is used as a biomarker, a marker of oxidative stress. And cysteine itself is a really important component because it plays a role in detoxifying the reactive oxygen species. So it has an important role. And it's also important for fatty acid synthesis. And so we saw that actually cysteine was enriched and um, proportionally, it was higher in people that had lower lung function. So there are tests for the lung, so that people who had more COPD had a higher cysteine also. So not only do we see it overrepresented in HIV, but we see it overrepresented with decline in lung function. So because we can't determine whether the different metabolites belong to any of the bacteria, what we can do is these, are these correlation analyses. So we take the metabolites and we look at how they're correlated with any of the bacteria in our whole group. And we see that actually some of the, the key bacteria are staph and things like streptococcus. So what we usually associate with pathogens in, in the lung. And so we're starting to now better understand what is going on at the functional level with uh, the lung and HIV and COPD. And so we're starting to have a model of what could be going on when you have HIV. Here I see that you have an uh, alteration in immunity, and the, you can have all sorts of other influences. And I talk about a shift in microbiota, but we don't see a big shift in microbiota. What we see is really at the functional level, and I didn't show you the microbial transcriptome or the metatranscriptome, where we see an increase in certain, um, certain molecules that can cause lung damage, and then COPD. And we also see a lot of inflammation in the host transcriptome. So that's at a very, so it's a narrow view. We're looking at the bacteria specifically. But what is going on with the microbiome? So the microbiome we don't hear about as much, and that's the fungal population in the lungs. So remember, I'm telling you, when you breathe, you breathe, you know, 
lots of cubic square of uh, cubic uh, milliliters and grams of fungus, bacteria, all kinds of things all the time. And so we decided to use that information to better understand what is happening in the overall microbiome. And so if we look at HIV, so Julie mentioned this morning about pneumocystis, and we see it associated with HIV. It's a very strong association. It was one of the first fungus that was determined to be an opportunistic pathogen in HIV. And we see a strong association with COPD. So if you're HIV positive, no COPD, and HIV positive with COPD, you'll have more of pneumocystis in HIV positive, COPD positive. So it's there. So we decided to do the same sort of analyses. So now, while before we were looking only at the bacteria, now we decided to look also at the fungus in the same location in the lungs. So here I'm showing a single domain interaction networks. So same idea of these networks you saw before. Now I didn't color the positive or negative interactions in these particular networks. But what you see right away is that the bacterial network is far denser, far more interactions, which we've seen also in the upper respiratory tract. But the fungal network is more sparse. And we see a lot of these, what we call the singletons, a lot of these fungus that don't seem, or species that don't seem to be interacting with others based on their co-occurrence. And we look at how many of these different connections go down or up. How many do they have? So we see here far more edges in bacteria than we see in the fungal network. Now, if I compare to the skin microbiome, which is one of the few data sets, so I'm also a parasite. And uh, it's been analyzed from data that was posted publicly the, for the skin. And the skin, they had bacteria and fungus. And it's rare to get for a microbiome project both together. And here you see a complete different type of network. You see it's tighter in the skin. And, that, and it's very similar to the bacteria, which we don't see in the lungs. So if we bring the networks together, we actually here, remember all my singletons for the fungus? Here what we see is a tighter network where we get slightly more edges, that means more connections, but what we also see is that we only have one fungus that doesn't interact with anybody. So we're seeing a lot of cross-domain interactions. That means fungus controlling bacteria, bacteria controlling fungus, and bacteria controlling each other, and fungus controlling each other. So now we're starting to get a better profile of interaction of what may be going on in the lungs. Now what we can do is focus now with our diseases, my HIV, my COPD. And here first, I want to show you, uh, because of this uh, interaction that was very tight, if you focus only on the red line and the purple line, these correspond to the cross kingdom interactions. And in this exercise, what we do is computationally, we take all those nodes that were interacting tightly because of short edges and a lot of edges, and we start taking out the nodes one by one. And it's only when we get to about 60% of those tight nodes that we take out that we start, start losing the number of interactions that occur. While if you just look at a bacterial network, a fungal network, it's very unstable. So that actually what's going on in your respiratory tract is that these interactions between bacteria and fungal render that microbiome very stable. And so fungus are important in the ecology of your respiratory tract. So I mentioned COPD and HIV. So here, let's look at that same network. This is the cross kingdom network. And now I look at people who are COPD positive or COPD negative. And the colors, if you're orange, that means it's these bacteria or fungus are only found in COPD negative patients. And if you're blue, you're only found in the COPD positive patients. And now let's focus into the neighborhoods 
where you only see the nodes that are COPD negative or only the nodes that are COPD positive. And what we see here, these nodes, so you see this interaction, you see there's far more interaction just focusing on these COPD negative, far more interactions occurring between the nodes, indicating that there is something where there, the bacteria are controlling each other in a healthy environment, while in COPD positive, we get this sparse network where even across the bacteria and fungus, you're not getting a lot of interaction, so that there's a disruption of the ecology. Now, if I take my COPD negative and I take out all the in-betweens, that means the non-direct nodes, here the nodes are when they have a direct interactions between the only COPD negative, and I see they're well connected together, and you get cross-kingdom bacteria to fungus that are interacting. Now, if I look at sort of the same thing, but in the HIV, HIV positive or HIV negative group, I actually see that it's reversed, where my HIV negative has fewer interactions. And here's one that's interesting, is the red line indicates a negative interaction. And it turns out that pneumocystis and penicillin here never co-occur. So they're doing direct warfare with each other, and these are, are two fungi. And here in the HIV positive, we see a lot of interactions between fungi. And what we think is going on in HIV is actually we are seeing a lot of interactions, but they're between fungal species, and you have far more fungal species in HIV than you have in uh, the HIV negative. And I showed you only the clustering of the bacterial OTUs, telling you that the microbiota was very similar in HIV positive or HIV negative. But if I you look specifically at fungus, it's completely different. So the fungus has a different representation, whether you're HIV positive or HIV negative. And so there are a lot of different bacterial species that we're now realizing are in the environment. But if you're immunocompromised in any way, it has an effect on your health. So those fungus, the fungi or the bacteria that are commensals or naturally present in your environment, depending on the host or the immune status of the host, can become pathogens. And so just determining presence or absence of a bacteria or of a fungus will not tell you whether you will become sick or not. There are all sorts of other factors that come into play. So really what I, you know, the message is like the commensal bacteria may be protective. So even these bacteria that we consider, fun and even the fungus, here I just mentioned bacteria, but we saw in the case of flu that certain bacterial genera had some sort of protective role in the respiratory tract because they controlled the others. So there's really this interaction that's important. And we saw that something like flu vaccination can have an effect on your microbiome in some way, and we don't understand exactly how, but that effect can protect you from more severe disease than if you were not vaccinated. And so we think that in the microbiome field, we need to expand our studies so that we're not always focusing just on the bacteria, but we bring in other elements. So here I mentioned the fungus, but it could be also the protozoa. You are picking up all kinds of things. So if I sample an individual from certain parts of the world, I may be picking up a lot of parasites, protozoa, that have an effect also on the whole microbiome. And so the key message is that high connectivity appears to be important for health, and it may protect you from more severe disease. That's it. And I want to just thank the uh, Laura Tipton is a PhD student who just graduated a few months ago, and she did all the studies of the COPD interactions, and uh, she was the first to do these interkingdom interactions. And that was with the help of 
Rich Bono and Christian Mueller, who are at the Simons Institute and at NYU, and they're the ones who developed this speakeasy tool to look at cross-kingdom interactions. And Tao Ding is a postdoc in my lab who uh, did, is doing all the studies on influenza with the help of Adam and Yishuan, who's a master's student, and Adam, who uh, works in my lab as the head technician. And my collaborators, I uh, collaborate with clinicians who are also researchers and have access to a lot of human samples. That seems to always be uh, the limiting factor for someone like me in genomics, where having access to real samples from the clinic or from the hospital uh, is important for the studies we do. And Sushma is developing all the work on looking at the metabolites and the metabolome in, the, uh, in COPD. And Ted Ross is a collaborator at University of Georgia who uh, does all the, actually, animal, the ferret work. He's got like a huge number of ferrets that we've been uh, working on. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for a very, very exciting talk and insights. Um, I'm not a, a biologist, not a scientist. I, I want to see if I understand this correctly. We're saying that I'm looking at, let's call it the influenza. We have uh, an outside agent appears. The flora doesn't shift, but the signaling, in a sense, shifts so that the dynamic begins to change. Is that a fair statement? Right, so just to repeat your question, in case people didn't hear, the, so you're saying that you have an agent that is disrupting not necessarily the flora in its presence or absence, right. but the signaling and right. the, the function. Right, so it's very, what we might call in a societal context, curation. Curation, that's right. Right, right. it's a very interesting analogy, by the way, uh, this. Uh, the question I would have then is, what about, has, has there been an attempt or thought about doing a flora transplant to see what happens, whether the new flora, uh, the new flora actually, the, whether there's some inherent disruption to the flora itself or that's in some sense is permanent or temporal, or whether it is that environment which then causes the transplanted flora to behave in essentially the same fashion. Uh, and, so anyway, this is just so exciting and so many different possibilities. I'll just leave it at that. So if I understand your question, you're saying, so if let's say I was transmitting my microbiome to someone that's either sterile or has never been exposed to the same respiratory microbiome of me, of, that I have, would that have an well, effect? Well, let's, let's uh, put it slightly differently. I'll take the person at, at day zero. Okay, there, right. So they, they're not infected. I have a copy I take out or have a copy of their flora. Now at day two, what I do is I replace the flora that's in there, surrounded by infection right. influence, and see what happens then. So uh, uh, we've actually talked of doing that, take, but we don't know how to do it. Right, yeah. We wouldn't know how to preserve it, basically. Um, so we thought the best way to do it, uh, but you'd have to do a lot of animals. And so our ferrets are caged often together. And unfortunately, the way, um, so we started doing the microbiome, we wanted to look at the transmission because we suspect, so we, I work a lot on virus transmission, mm -hmm. we suspect that your microbiome is transmitted also. Right. Mm -hmm. So we thought what we could do is determine within the cages whether you see similar microbiome between the ferrets. And what we look at in our influenza studies is actually disease severity. So some ferrets, just like humans, when you get the flu, if any of you get the flu, can guarantee that 20% of you will have severe flu, 20 to 25% will not even know you're infected, and the rest are somewhere in between. Ferrets do the same thing. So they're, and you can't predict in advance. And so we thought maybe the microbiome has a protective effect in some way. And we've seen some bacteria that may be actually protective. So have you tried to look at the correlation between um, the severity of illness 
and the disruption to signaling? Uh, the sig Which would you be your edges, basically? Right, right, right. So, um, so the severity, so right now we're actually looking at severity in those networks, pre-infection, post-infection, and then we want to separate the post-infection by, severe, by severity. But right now we didn't have the numbers of ferrets uh, to be able to do that. Thank you. Good questions. I think Larry has a question. Or were you just stretching? Um, <laughs> as just far stretching. as I can get. Uh, so this is the smallest of technical questions, because I yes. don't know anything about ferrets. Are, are ferrets that are used in this kind of work inbred ferrets? Or they are? No, they, they're they, outbred. They're outbred. Yeah, So in that outbred. way, they have lots and lots of heterogeneity from animal to animal. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we, we look at that specifically. Now what we're doing is actually also doing their genetic background that we want to use, because this is part of a, a much larger systems biology project we're doing, and we're looking at the host uh, transcriptome, looking at the glycome also, and we're looking at the genetic background to see if there are any effects, and also uh, looking at Oh, in the human population, so for ferrets, we're not doing that, but in the human population that we are analyzing the same way, we're looking at your history of what you've been exposed to before in flu and whether that has an effect on your disease severity. So you want to put a pitch in for, you want to, you want to pitch? <laughs> that for the, oh no, yes. So actually, tell the NIH. Because in that project, we were supposed to get the proteome done at the same time, and the reviewers cut that project out. And so we, we're not funded for the proteome, but we, are hope, we hope to be in the future. So I have a question about the, the microbiome response to vaccination. Could the uh, change in, in the microbiome population when you're vaccinated, even if you don't develop immunity, be due to a response to the vaccine adjuvant, which is, of course, what we add to jumpstart our innate immune system? Right. So that's a very good question, and we don't know the answer. So we just put in a proposal to part of trying to renew the systems biology program to actually look at that specifically, look at just the vehicle versus the actual vaccine, and then look at the microbiome in the different groups. Now, for children, the vaccine is different also. It's a live uh, attenuated, while uh, for the, uh, the senior population, it's a killed virus. So that may also have an effect in the difference that we observe. I, th I think we should move on now to um, our next speaker. Thank you very much, Elodie. Thank you.